Hey everyone, my name is Mita, and I want to take a moment to thank you for joining us online. We're going to worship together, read some scripture with one of our teaching pastors, and hear more about how our church is being a good neighbor in our community. We may be in San Diego, but if we're not in your area, we still have resources for you to check out. Make sure you subscribe to Garden Music on YouTube and our daily devotional podcast. Let's go to church together.
church, we believe that worship isn't just singing songs. It's also getting our hands dirty and serving in our communities. It's showing our love for God through loving our neighbors. If you want to serve beyond just a good neighbor day, head over to our website for all the ways you can make your impact. Simply sign up and you'll be put in contact with our team leads who will tell you where and when to show up. After that, the task is simple, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Sign up today. Praise aloud, 
sing his praise Good morning, 10.30. Hey, on a serious note, thank you for making this adjustment. Our goal as a church is to have open seats at optimal times, open seats at optimal times. And at 10 o'clock, we had no open seats. And so it's really good that at 9 o'clock this morning, uh, here's the good news about this this, uh, service change. It worked, okay? So 9 o'clock was full this morning, which was awesome. And uh, it's so awesome to see all of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for making that adjustment with us. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, awesome to see all these uh, young men and women dedicated this morning. Wouldn't you agree? I just love being a part of a church where we commission the next generation. And uh, even for those babies that were asleep, it, it still counts in case you're nervous, mom and dad. It still counted, okay? Uh, we don't need to do it again next week, all right? Uh, we uh, say around here a lot, if you've been with us for a while, Uh, Go first. In fact, let's just say that together as we begin the fall. One, two, three. 
go first. And if you're new with us, that might be confusing. Why, why do we say go first? In fact, a couple weeks ago, I was walking through the, uh, the atrium with my uh, seven-year-old, and he goes, Dad, shouldn't it be go last? Uh, and I said, no, why? And he said, uh, well, Jesus said the first or last. And uh, so we're changing it, okay? Now it's go last, right? <laughs> Just kidding. I sent him to military school, and uh, he's... Uh, that is true. Jesus did say that. But go first for us is that you would show up in moments as a leader with an expectancy that God's going to do something wherever you go. Uh, we believe as a church, everybody's a leader. And you may not get a paycheck for that. I may not be next to your title at work, but you are a leader of your family. People are following you at work. You're a leader of a team. You might lead one or two people. Uh, you, you might be you know, a student, but you're leading. And as a Christ follower, uh, you've been deputized to lead in some environment. And going first means that you'd be the first one to lead. It means that uh, if in your marriage there's uh, an awkward tension and nobody knows what to do, you would be the one to go first in solving it and asking for forgiveness. A uh, new neighbor moves in. You would be the one who goes first uh, to I introduce yourself. That we, We'd be a go first kind of person and a go first kind of church. And the series that we're going to start today on the book of Nehemiah is about leadership. And the hope of this series is that you would get clarity in your life around where you're inviting people that you're leading, whether it's your kids, whether it's uh, at work, get clarity around where it is that you're inviting people that you're leading and that you would be a person that is worth following, right? You want to have both of those, not just one, but you want to be a person who's not just leading, but you're a person as a husband, as a dad, as a leader at work that is actually worth following. When, when they do the, uh, the Gallup polls or the uh, Pew research and they ask people, what is it you look for in a leader? Who is it that you follow? One word, and you, you know this, it always surfaces to the top and it's the word integrity. Uh, in fact, how many of you would say, I want to follow somebody who has integrity? Uh, okay, I don't know what's wrong with the rest of you. Um, no, not a priority, Jared. Uh, <laughs> you want to follow people who have integrity. Uh, we, we, we always say that when we're asked. It's, it's the number one value over and over again. Uh, but in terms of leadership, while we value integrity, what we follow is actually somebody with clarity. We value integrity, but we follow clarity. Somebody who can paint a picture and say, this is the future. This is what I think the world should look like. This is what I think this team should look like. This is what this company should look like. This is what this family should look like. Somebody who has clarity around that and can cast a compelling vision towards that picture. That's who we follow. I'll give you an example of this, that we value uh, integrity, but we follow clarity. Uh, the, the big conversation right now uh, is, is the 2024 election. This is not a political thing, okay? So do not email me. Uh, uh, in 2024, uh, who will win the presidency? Who will even run for the presidency? We don't know. Uh, who's who's going to get elected? Will it be the person who has the highest degree of integrity? Uh, you laughed. I just said it. No. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I'm going to move on from this one. Okay. Uh, it will be the person with the highest degree of clarity. It's the person whose campaign slogan, whatever it is, uh, economically, overseas, foreign policy, can paint the clearest picture, a compelling vision, and say, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. We will, we will ignore integrity when we, for the sake of clarity. We want to follow people who have clarity. Uh, this is true at your office. If the CEO gets fired at your company and they introduce the new CEO, what is it that you're looking for in that moment? Do you want the board to stand up and say, hey, our new CEO, you know, she or he, you know, he's a family man and he'll be home by five o'clock to have dinner with his kids. No, that's not what you're, you want someone who says, hey, here's how we're going to turn this around. Here's the new vision. Here's the picture. You want somebody who has clarity. Now here, here's the goal. Okay. You can actually have both clarity and integrity do not have to be mutually exclusive. In fact, as Christ followers, whatever, wherever it is that you're currently leading, uh, you need to have both. Christ invites you to have both uh, clarity and integrity. And in the person of Nehemiah, we'll see this specifically today in terms of clarity. Next week in terms of integrity, we see a leader for Jerusalem, for Israel, 
who has both, who has clarity and has integrity. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Nehemiah chapter one. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screens. Nehemiah chapter one. Uh, now, if you don't read the Bible a whole lot or you're new to church, here's kind of, here's, here's how the Bible works. It's written over 1,500 years. It's 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Jesus comes in the New. Uh, and in the Old Testament, here was the big idea for the nation of Israel. You are blessed to be a blessing. And here's why we talk about the Old Testament, because that's still true. You and I, how many of you would say about your life today, I'm blessed? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, uh, the rest of you, we have a nine o'clock service. We'd love for you to come too, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, you're blessed. You're blessed with kids. Uh, you're blessed with resources, you're blessed with talents, you're blessed with all sorts of things that God has given you to enjoy. And the same was true for Israel. They were blessed. And God said this to Abraham in Genesis 12. You're blessed, but there's a caveat with that. You're blessed for the purpose of being a blessing. And with the nation of Israel, if they just enjoy the blessing, but they don't share the blessing... God takes the blessing away. That happens again and again in the Old Testament. Now, here's why this matters, because the same thing is true for you and I. If you just enjoy the blessings of God, but you don't learn to bless other people or share the blessings, the blessings get removed from our life. Now, you may hear that and go, well, that's cruel of God, but that's how you think as a parent, isn't it? Uh, if your kids just enjoy that you pay their bills, if you, they just enjoy the vacations you take them on, and they never learn to share, if you're driving down the road after you know, you've, you've taken them on vacation and you know, your son won't share a toy with his sister, what do you do? I will pull this car over so fast. <laughs> uh, I'll send you to military. Uh, you give them the speech. Because here's why. Because you do not want to raise entitled kids, do you? You don't want entitled children. In fact, for many of you, you'd say, that's my greatest fear, that my kids will be entitled. What creates an entitled spirit is enjoying the, 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 what someone else has earned, enjoying it, but never learning to share it. And here's the truth about you as a parent. Here's the truth about God. God does not want to raise entitled kids either. <laughs> And so for the nation of Israel, if they just enjoy and they don't bless others, God takes the blessing away. And so that's the story of Nehemiah. They are at a, po a point in their history where they are in what's called the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and this is one of the big overarching stories of the Old Testament. Many of the Psalms were written during this period. The book of Daniel was written during this period. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, world superpower, uh, around the year 722 AD, uh, BC, had conquered them. Well, if you fast forward about 250 years, the year 444 BC, 440 years before Jesus, uh, that's where this story that we're going to look at today takes place. Uh, Babylon had been conquered. This was how ancient history worked. A world superpower would rise. They would get defeated. And Persia has defeated Babylon. They're in charge. And Persia, they had a leader named Cyrus, uh, Billy Ray was his nickname. And <laughs> so stupid. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, he got all these Hebrew Jewish slaves and he says, I have no need for you. I don't know why Babylon conquered you and captured you, but I have no need for you. Go home. Well, the problem was it had been hundreds of years and their city, Jerusalem, the wall had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. And so for many of them, they, some did go home, but for many of them, they just stayed in Persian captivity because life was better in Babylon and Persia on the outskirts of Jerusalem than it was inside of it. And Nebuchadnezzar and his family, or excuse me, Nehemiah and his family were one of those families. Uh, Nehemiah's parents, his grandparents, they had never been to Jerusalem. They had lived their life in Persian rule and Persian captivity. Well, a little overview to this. Ezra and Nehemiah, if you've read those books before or you've heard of those books before, they're one big book. They tell the same story of returning from exile, the nation of Israel returning back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. And Ezra and Nehemiah, they tell the same story from different sides. Ezra is the spiritual leader. He's the preacher. 
He's the one who's going to uh, tell people to not worship pagan gods. Nehemiah is the pragmatic builder. He, Ezra's public, Nehemiah's private. Ezra is the guy who's going to fill the building. Nehemiah is the guy who's going to build the wall and construct the city. Ezra's got the dreams and the visions and the plans of what God wants to do. Nehemiah is the guy who quietly goes and applies for the city permit. He's a pragmatic guy. And this is how God works, by the way, again and again in the scriptures and in your life and in my life. Uh, God builds something. This is what Nehemiah does. He invites Nehemiah to, to participate with God in building the wall. This wall, by the way, you can still go to Jerusalem. The wall Nehemiah is going to construct is still there. God invites us to build something. And then God does the work of filling that which he's built. Again and again in the scriptures, how does Genesis 1 work? God builds a world, and then what does he do? He fills it up. That's why you're here, by the way. Uh, he fills it with people, animals, plants, vegetation. Uh, God invites Solomon to construct a temple, King Solomon. He says, hey, build a temple. And so he gets to work. They begin to lay the foundation of a temple. What does God do when the temple is constructed? This is not a trick question, all right? All right. He fills it up with his presence. Uh, this is how your body works, by the way. Uh, God built you, uh, your, your physical structure, God's built you. And Paul says in the New Testament again and again, he wants to what? To fill you up with the Holy Spirit of God. So you have purpose and direction in your life. That's what Jesus Christ comes and does for you. That you wouldn't just be, we use the word empty on the inside, but you'd be filled up with the purposes and the power of God. That's what you want in your life, right? And so that's the invitation again and again. And here's the big promise of today, okay? You and I get to work on building something, and then we trust that God is going to fill it. Well, how do I get clarity around what I'm supposed to build? That's the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, starting at verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the, months of, in the month of Kislev, they're not on the uh, Julian calendar, by the way, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. So he's working for the king of Persia, Nehemiah, in Persia. Han and I, one of his brothers, came from Judah. So he had a brother who lived in Judah, Jerusalem. Comes back with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. So there's a handful of men and women who had returned to Jerusalem. The economy was bad. Uh, the People were worshiping pagan gods and goddesses. The city was not safe. In the ancient world, the wall was for safety. The temple was for worship. There was no temple and there was no wall. And so they come back and they tell Nehemiah, who's got a pretty good life in Persia working for the king, and they say, it is really bad in Jerusalem. And so when he heard about all this, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. It had been broken down 250 years earlier by Nebuchadnezzar. It still lies in ruin, Nehemiah. And its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So he gets the news that his ancestors homeland, where his brother lives, is lying in ruin, and he sits down, and he we it just it bothers him. It frustrates him. It breaks his heart. Uh, let me ask you a question today. I, I, what is it that if you and I went to lunch, and you started to talk about some problem, some pain point, some issue, maybe it's culture, whatever it may be, it would just cause you to sit down and weep? Uh, what is it that when, when you think about it, you go, oh my God, this, this just breaks my heart. For some of us, it might be in terms of your family right now, a relationship with a son or daughter, and you go, I don't know how we've gone this long and we haven't healed the, the wounds of years ago. Uh, for some of us, uh, how many of us, when you think about the next generation and you think about the world that your kids and your grandkids are going to inherit, it bothers you. You have concerns. You, 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 if you really thought about it, you would sit down and weep. How, how many of us? Of course. 
for some of us, it, it's the neighborhood that you live in. You, you, you have conversation with friends and you, you, you see the, the, the spiritual vacancy of their spirit and that they have a body, but they're, they're empty on the inside. And when you think about your neighbors, when you think about your coworkers, oh my God, it just, it, it breaks your heart. You would just sit down and weep. And inside of your frustrations and inside of your burdens is the invitation from the Lord. It's clarity around what God is inviting you to participate in and your vision for your life. Oftentimes, uh, people ask me, Jerry, how did you become a pastor? You know, we, you know, when did you decide to become a preacher? And, you know, it wasn't like I was eight years old and, you know, my friend wanted to be a race car driver. And I was like, I'm going to be a pastor one day. Uh, the, essentially, uh, it was, uh, I was in and out of ministry for, uh, in my 20s. And in my early 30s, Rosanna and I, we lived on the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. We just had our first uh, son, who's now 11 years old, and he was about six months old at the time. And we were praying, thinking through some career changes. And I began to realize that, uh, how many of you have been to Europe recently? And when you go to Europe, it doesn't matter where you go, there are a lot of bars that used to be churches. And it's because these thriving spiritual epicenters of cities 50 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, there are no people to fill up those churches. And so they're bought and they're sold and they're turned into bars all over Europe. And I began to realize the same thing was happening in the United States. That, and you've seen the stories on Fox News or CNN where the, the, the amount of people who go to church, the amount of people who had claimed Christianity as their faith, uh, it, it's, it, it has diminished significantly. And that began to bother me. Rosanna and I began to pray. And you ever had one of those moments where you're going, somebody should do something about that? Uh oh. <laughs> and I remember Rosanna and I, we were sitting, we just built this house and we just redid the whole house and we were. In the outskirts of Atlanta, we're sitting on the front step one Saturday morning and we were praying together and we were just praying, God, if, if there's something you want us to do, would you just make it clear? God, if there's something you want us to do, and we have the same burden. And I remember opening my eyes and Rosanna was holding our son in one arm and then she was holding onto the spindle of the stairway in the other hand. And I said, babe, why are you gripping the spindle? And she said, because I was praying while you were praying, God, don't take my house. God, don't take my house. God, don't take my house. <laughs> And I started praying, God, I hope she keeps me and not the house. I don't. But inside of that burden was clarity around what God was inviting us to participate in, what God was inviting us to do. And when you get that moment, when you get that picture inside of your frustrations, there is going to be clarity around what God wants you to do. Your frustrations right now are God's invitations for what you're to do tomorrow participate in the solution. Don't just complain about it. Get involved. Do something. Roll up your sleeves. And Nehemiah gets that burden. He gets a picture. He gets clarity. How's it going to work if I begin to rebuild Jerusalem? Nobody's cared about this in 250 years. I don't know. I just have a picture around what we're supposed to do. And so he goes to the king and he's terrified. Eventually, when you get a vision, you get clarity around what God's inviting you to do, the risk that God's inviting you to take, all of a sudden, you have to start to share that with people. And that's the terrifying moment. When it's just your idea, no big deal. But when you start talking about it, that's where the problems are, right? And so he goes to the king, King Anaxerxes, and he's the king of Persia. And Anaxerxes knows that Jerusalem lies in ruin. And he says, Anaxerxes, uh, I want to go home. Here, here's the story. Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Anaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. So he's buttering him up a little bit. Keep drinking, buddy. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? Then this cannot be nothing but sadness of heart. And he says, I was very much afraid. How many of you, you've had a compelling vision, you had a compelling picture for your business, for your family, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, the excitement got washed away by fear. That's Nehemiah. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Again, he's buttering him up. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? 
and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it that you want? He was a cupbearer, or he's a servant of the king. He says, what is it that you want? And he's talking to those powerful men of the world. He says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. This is Nehemiah. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him, and Xerxes, send me to the city of Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can go and I can rebuild it. And he shares with Anaxerxes. He begins to share with some of the other people that were exiles in Persia. Here's my vision. Here's my picture. Here's what I'm supposed to do. And Anaxerxes, if you know the story, he sends him back to Jerusalem. And, and Nehemiah doesn't necessarily have a plan. He just has a, a picture. How, how many of us do you remember uh, this? <laughs> Anybody you don't remember this? Okay, pay a youth tax on your way out. This is called a, a Polaroid. I think these are making a comeback. Uh, this is a Polaroid picture. Hey, you remember those days when you actually had to wait on something? Uh, if you're under 30, let me explain how the world used to be. Uh, 56K dial-up. That's how the Polaroid experience was. And you would take it. Remember, I remember my mom on the seventh grade field trip sent me with one of these. And I would take pictures with friends. And I'd be like, okay, wait here like 15 minutes. It's going to be a good one. But you take the picture. And then what did you do when you took the picture? Remember what you did? Yeah, some outcast fans here apparently, all right. <laughs> Quoting that in church. What's wrong with you? Huh? Yeah, you shake it. You shake it. You shake it like a, like a Polaroid picture yeah <laughs> outcast lyrics and will ferrell quotes is half my sermons uh, <laughs> yeah you shake you wait and all of a sudden what was fuzzy it becomes in view we'll see what this one is i think it's probably somewhere over there uh, but it comes into view and you wait and that's the process of getting clarity around what god wants you to do with your life uh, you, you get a, a spiritual Polaroid. You all of a sudden in prayer or in conversation, you're talking to some friends and something burdens you. For some reason, it surfaces to the top of the pile. For some reason, it burdens you more than it burdens other people. For some reason, God seems to have laid something on your heart. You have a frustration that comes out of your lips again and again and again and again. And you start praying around that frustration. Why am I not the spiritual leader of my home? Why is it that at my office, everybody comes to work and everybody works on something, but nobody knows each other. Why is it that I don't have a relationship with them? Why is it that there's this need in the marketplace and nobody seems to have stepped in to fill it? All of a sudden, you start having a, you start having a picture and you wait, you pray, and you start saying, okay, God, this is what your quiet time should look like this week, okay? You just take the Bible, just do this. Like, God, just give me a, give me a picture and you don't know how to do it, but you just have a compelling vision. And whatever God's vision is for your life, it should be so big that if God's not involved, you're in trouble. You can't do it on your own. Don't have a vision that's so small that you don't even necessarily need God to accomplish it. Oh, I could have done that, yeah. It'd be nice if God you know, made it easier. Uh, your office, man, what would it look like if the men and women I work with came to faith? I can't do that. I'm not the Holy Spirit of God. I just have a picture of what it could look like. That's what happens with Nehemiah. All of a sudden, he just gets a picture and he starts inviting people. Hey, let's participate in this. He's afraid, sure. But he goes home and he begins to survey the damage. How many of you have ever gotten involved in something and it sounded like a good idea at the time, but then you realize it's way harder and way worse than you thought? If you can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> and that's what happens. Nehemiah goes home and he realizes nobody cares about God. Nobody cares that the city's not safe. Nobody cares that the economy's in ruin. Nobody cares about the faith of the next generation. Nobody cares about any of the problems that should be what they care about. And Nehemiah just begins to share his vision and his picture with people. What would it look like if we rebuilt the wall? 
what would it look like? And people start asking how. And Nehemiah is going, I don't know, ready, fire, aim. I have no idea how this is going to work. I'm just going to share with you what I think God has placed on my heart. And he starts to give them clarity. And other people start to say, wouldn't it be great if we had a wall? Wouldn't it be great if we had a temple? Wouldn't it be great? And Nehemiah just gets to work and he has clarity and he's sharing the clarity with people. When you get that vision, when you get that picture of what God wants you to do with your life, don't worry about the how. How many of you in, maybe it's in your marriage, you're the, like the visionary, you get the great ideas. And then your spouse is like, well, how are you gonna do that? And you're like, don't ruin it. <laughs> You know, like, we're going to take a trip to Ireland and stay at a castle and there'll be ponies and unicorns. You know. How? I don't know. Allow for the picture to sit. Just allow, don't ask the how. Just sit with the picture. That's what Nehemiah does. He just casts the vision. I have clarity. And when you have clarity around what God's asking you to do with your life, inside of those frustrations and those tensions, when you get a picture you're going to find resistance, aren't you? When all of a sudden you stand up in your family and say, hey, I know I've never been the spiritual leader, but we're going to be a family that takes faith serious. Your kids who are 50 years old are going to look at you and go, really, you? When you stand up in your office and you say, you know what, I don't know your hopes and anxieties, but I'm going to start praying for you. And I'm going to start asking you questions, not just about work and Q3, but I'm going to start to be a person who I think God has put me on this floor, not just to work here, but to pastor this particular division, this particular floor. People are going to look at you and be like, really, Frank, you, you're going to act spiritual now. We saw you a couple years ago. You'll meet resistance. Nehemiah meets resistance. Notice what happens when he goes home. It says, he replies to the people, verse 18, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Grab your hammers, grab the tools. Let's get to work. But when Sam, Sambalot, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, official of Geshem, the heir heard, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. Anybody got a Sambalot in your life right now? Coming against you? You work with somebody and like, maybe it used to be front now. You're like, that guy is human sandpaper, man. He just, everything I do, he's just against me. You will meet resistance. What is this you're doing? They said, are you rebelling against the king? In other words, you work for Anaxerxes. Does he know you're here trying to do this? And ironically, he had gotten Anaxerxes to pay for it. He was funding the whole mission because one of the things you'll realize is that when God has placed some vision, some burden in your heart, he's gone ahead of you and he's saying, hey, you do the building, I'll do the filling. He's cleared pathways for you. And that's part of the power of experiencing the Holy Spirit in your life is you realize, wait a second, God's in this thing. And so he's gone ahead of him. And he says this, and I love this. He said, I answered them by saying, and this has to be your answer as well. The God of heaven will give us success. How? I don't know. I'm just expecting. What's going to happen? I don't know. I just know the God of heaven will give us success. I just have a picture of what I think God's inviting me to do. And I'm starting to move in that direction. I don't even know how. But I'm going to cast a vision with some clarity and say this is what it could look like. And I know for some of us, you go, that sounds great if you're a preacher, and, you, know, uh, you know, maybe if you're a, a poet, I don't know, who, I'm just trying to survive the days, man. I'm just trying to get to work on time and kind of fly under the radar. Uh, you know, I know I'm supposed to be a good person. I'm not really asking God to use me in any purposeful way. Well, I guarantee you, if you and I went to lunch, it would take a couple minutes and you would start to share some burden, some frustration, your kids, your marriage, your neighbors, your coworkers. Inside of that frustration is God's invitation. This is your purpose. You have clarity in that frustration. Why is it you are so burdened over that and nobody else is? Because God's inviting you to do something about it. And all of a sudden, all you need in this moment is just a picture, not a how, but just a picture. What if? 
Where's the frustration? It could be your house right now. And you would say, you know what? What bothers me? What frustrates me? Is my 17-year-old goes that way? My 15-year-old goes that way? We never eat together. I don't really know what's going on in their life. What if, and and you just have a picture that on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights, we were all around the same table and I knew their hopes and I knew their anxieties and I asked them before they went to sleep, how can I pray for you? And that was the picture of what it could be. What if in your office you said, you know, and I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know if HR is going to let me, but I'm going to start to ask people on my team what their hopes are, what their anxieties are, how I can care for them, what I can do for them. Because I don't just believe I work here. I believe God's placed me here as a pastor on this team, on this particular floor of this particular company for this particular moment. I've been appointed. It's a divine appointment for this moment. And I'm trusting that somehow that could be what God's brought me here to do. On my neighborhood, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm tired of my neighbors pulling in their garages and nobody knows each other. We're just gonna pass out some flyers. We're gonna invite people over for a backyard barbecue. And I'm gonna ask my neighbors what their hopes are, what their dreams are, what their anxieties are, because I believe God's placed me on this street to care about the spiritual condition of others. And I don't know how it's gonna work and I don't even know who's gonna come, but I just have a picture of what could be. And all of a sudden, wherever it is in your life, whatever it is that you're leading, when you have a picture of what could be, the Spirit of God will begin to fuel that with a conviction around what should be. It's not just that it could be a family that looks like this. My goodness, it should be a family that looks like this. And that's the divine real estate of your life. That's where heaven meets earth. When all of a sudden you've got the picture, God, could this be? God, are you inviting me to do this? And all of a sudden, you begin to show up and God says, it's not just that it could be, but your heart and your faith and your spirit are fueled with a fire around what should be and you have conviction. And the spirit of God meets you in that place. And then you start casting that vision to your kids. You start casting that vision to your team. You start casting that vision to the two people that work for you. You start casting that vision to your four-year-old. You start casting that vision. Hey, here's what could be. And you know what starts to happen? People start following clarity and they start having a conviction, not just around what could be, but also around what should be. And just like those with Nehemiah, they start grabbing hammers and they start getting getting to work and God's gone ahead of you. Isn't that what you want? A purpose where you wake up every day and you go, my goodness, I don't just walk around and have frustrations. I received an invitation from the Lord to do something. And then this week, don't get confused or complicated with the how. You'll get there. But just spend some time saying, God, I'm going to build it. I'm going to build the relationships with my kids. I'm going to build that kind of relationship with my wife this week. I'm going to build that relationship at work that I've been ignoring that you've been putting on my heart. I'm going to build that relationship with a neighbor. I'm going to go build it, God. And here's my prayer, God. I'm going to build it. I'm trusting that you're building it with me. But God, I'll do the building, but I need you to do the filling. And isn't that what you want with your life? A story that you rolled up your sleeves and you built things that mattered and the Spirit of God filled it up? And you could stand back and say, look, I, I just dreamed of this. Whew. God did all this. He met my ordinary with his extraordinary. He, he brought the infinite into my finite. And I just got to watch. I just got to tell a God-sized story of reality that at one point was just a God-sized dream of what could be. And God's used me in a powerful, powerful way. That's what God's invited. This week, just begin to pray, God, I'll build it. Will you fill it? Will you do the God thing? (laughs) Will you bring the supernatural into this space where I don't know what to do and I don't know how it works? And God will bless and God will honor that prayer because you're trying to do what has been the message of the people of God from the very beginning. You are blessed to be a blessing. Go bless others with a compelling vision God's laid in your heart. Would you just pray with me this fall? What is it God wants me to do? What is it he's inviting me to do? Some of you are starting businesses. God, we're going to build it. Will you fill it up? And we're not just going to care about profits. We're going to care about people. God, I want to launch this thing. I want to do this thing. I want to dream this for my sports team. I want to dream this for the team that God's placed me on, the hallway that I walk every day at school. God, I'm dreaming this up. What if it looked like this? 
will you meet me there? I'll build it, and God, I'll do the building if you'll do the filling up. Isn't this what Jesus Christ did for you? When your life laid in chaos, when the walls have been knocked down, Jesus Christ entered into your chaos and he had a picture of what you could be and you started to see that and you started to get conviction around who you should be as a follower of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden you were 17 years old, you were 42 years old, it was after that marriage ended, you started to get a picture of what your life could be and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit began to show up into your story and put you back together when you didn't know what to do. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ did that for you? And now you get the opportunity to go and to do that for others. Be the, 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 the visionary. Be the person who says this is what it could be. And watch. And imagine if you had a story. Not just of what could be, but what should be. And how God used you to accomplish and build something for his purposes. Let's pray together. God, use all of us. as dreamers, as the first one to hope, the first one to see what nobody else sees. God, would you raise us up? Would we do for others what Christ has, has done for us? God, I pray for a, a mom that as I've been talking, she knows it's a relationship with a son or daughter that has, that has somehow fallen apart. And I just pray, Spirit of God, would they pick up the phone? Would they begin to build and rebuild that which has been knocked down. And would they trust in the awkward silence and the unknown? Would you fill it up? God, I pray for, maybe it's a young entrepreneur who's launching something, his knees are knocking. He thinks you've put this picture in his head and his heart. And God, I just pray, as he takes the steps, he takes a risk to build this thing. God, would you fill it up? Would he trust you as he does the building? We trust you to do the filling. God, I pray for all of us in this room, in our apartment complexes, in our streets, in our neighborhoods. Would we go first? Would you give us a picture of what our neighborhood could be and a conviction of what should be? Would you give us access to our coworkers' hearts and their hopes and their anxieties? Would we dream up workplaces and offices where we are pastors and we've been commissioned and deputized by the Holy Spirit of God to build relationships and we'll build God if you do the filling. God, every single one of us in this room, would you place something inside of us that's bigger than us, that's about others, that impacts others, so that you give us God-sized dreams and God-sized stories of who we could be and how you could use us, every single man, every single woman, every single student in this room. Would you give us a vision for the next generation and not just a dream, but on the other side of this wall, God, as volunteers right now in this very moment are building it, would you fill it up, the hearts of 16-year-olds and 12-year-olds with your Holy Spirit, God? Would you continue to allow us to be the architects. And would you fill it up, God, with your presence? Give us a dream. Give us a conviction. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Grace and peace. There is no one like you, 
There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. You are worthy, God. of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Yes, you are. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Thanks for coming to church with us today. We want you to know that we are here for you. If you want to connect with a pastor or counselor, please call the church at the number below. And don't forget to engage with our daily devotionals and worship throughout the week with garden music wherever you like to stream. We'll see you next time.